All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining my talk today. Uh, so my name is Thomas, and as you can imagine, based on what's written in the slide, I'll be talking about Billroot. Before we get started, I'll introduce myself shortly. I work at Bootlin. Uh, we are a consulting company providing uh, embedded Linux expertise. We do engineering services, so we help our customers uh, doing uh, development of their Linux BSPs for their custom hardware, uh, doing Linux kernel driver development. We do a lot of build root or Yocto integration, uh, real-time, boot time, security, multimedia, pretty much all things embedded Linux related. So I think this is important to point out that we're not a build root only consulting company. Sometimes we've been seen that, that, that way, but we do also a lot of Yocto uh, work. And my colleague Alex, who is in the room, will be talking about some of the work we do on Yocto tomorrow at, at this conference. We also provide uh, training services around pretty much the same topics. And the reason I'm talking to you today about build root is because I'm one of its co-maintainers. I've been working on this project since 2008, contributed thousands of patches to it, and I've been like, deeply involved for a long time in its, in its community. I used to do um, some amount of work on the Linux kernel, and I speak regularly here at ELC, and I'm also part of the program committee of that, that conference. Uh, now you've heard me speaking for two minutes, and you've realized I'm French, um, and I indeed come from the southwest of France, uh, namely the city of Toulouse. So today, um, I want to start um, with some really basics on what is build root, just to make sure that everybody in the, in the room is uh, on the same page with that. Uh, briefly compare with Yocto, because that's kind of the question that always comes up. So uh, rather than waiting for the Q&A session, I thought, OK, let's, let's address that question right at the start of the talk. And then we'll get to the, the bulk of the, the, the talk, which is what's new, what are the new things, or the changes, the improvements that took place in Bidroot over the past two years. And you can see already a list of the things that I'll be, I'll be covering. Uh, so what is, what is Bidroot? It's an embedded Linux build system. For, so for those of you who do embedded Linux work, it, it's probably a familiar uh, wording. It's a tool that automates the process of cross-compiling the different software components uh, that you need to build a fully functional embedded Linux system. So Buildroot can build uh, your tool chain or, and or cross-compiler. It can build one or several bootloaders. Uh, it can build your Linux kernel image. And it can build a complete root file system with an arbitrary number of user space applications and libraries. And all of that is done by cross-compiling directly from source code, which gives you a lot of flexibility. You can upgrade or customize any component in your system. You can optimize how they are compiled. So compared to binary distributions, which are more like uh, used as is, you can, with a build system, much more finely tune what goes into your embedded Linux system. Um, so it has a similar aim as Yocto Open Embedded, uh, as OpenWRT, as PTXDist, with, of course, some differences, but the, the general aim is kind of the same. Um, Buildroot relies on well-known technologies. Um, sometimes this is one of the reasons why people uh, like Buildroot. Um, Buildroot is written in Make. Uh, which is a technology that's pretty ubiquitous in the, in the embedded Linux space. Not necessarily the easiest and simplest, but it's, it's ubiquitous at least. And it uses kconfig for the configuration, which is also widely used in the Linux kernel, in uBoot, and in many other uh, embedded Linux, let's say, low-level uh, software components. It's simple to use and learn. Um, that's the other reason why a lot of people uh, tend to, to like uh, Buildroot. Um, the typical use case, of course, it it's, uh, gets a bit more complex, but the very basic starting point is you run make mini config, you configure your system, what you want into it, you run make, it builds, and you profit. So the starting um, curve uh, of, of learning Buildroot is, is really smooth. Um, there are over 2,800 built-in packages. Um, in, in Buildroot, which means we have lots of major software stack pre-packaged, pre uh, things like uh, GStreamer, Wayland, and Go, or Node.js, or all these big software stacks are pre-packaged, so you don't have to worry about packaging them yourself. And of course, that can be extended with, with more packages. And many packages get added, uh, may, maybe not every day, but on a regular basis. And that's part of the things I will be covering later. Um, it's uh, driven by a very active community of developers and users, and I'll have some numbers um, uh, later in, in the talk. And it's used by many companies. We see contributions from uh, silicon vendors, from companies making um, uh, final products, embedded, uh, embedded products. Uh, we also have a lot of OBS contributing to Beardroot. So it's really a diverse community uh, that is actively maintaining that, um, that, uh, that build system. And I think we're uh, probably the oldest still maintained build system. Um, Buildroot was started in 2001. Uh, so even before Open Embedded was, was a thing. Um, and, and we're still actively maintaining and extending that, that tool. 
So now the one question that everybody asks, as I said, is, okay, why would I use Buildroot? Everybody is talking about Yocto. Um, so I wanted to kind of summarize um, some of the, the differences. If you want to learn more about that, um, Alex and myself gave a talk exactly on that topic, I don't know, many years ago at, at ELC. Um, so you can find the video and slides online if, if that's um, relevant to you. But kind of the, the summary uh, of the, the main differences, at least from my perspective, I think everybody can have a different opinion on that. Um, the first main difference is in what it builds. What is the, the product, the results of, of um, what Yocto or, or Append Embedded and Buildroot gives you? Of course, at the end of the day, it's producing an embedded Linux um, um, system, but the actual result is, is slightly different. Yocto, Open Embedded, really builds you a distribution with the concept of binary packages and a package management system. So out of Open Embedded, you can get a number of binary packages. You can select some of them to be directly installed into a root file system image that you flash on your device. But then on your device, you have access to a package management system that allows you to install, remove uh, individual software components or update them individually. Uh, very much like you would have on your uh, Ubuntu Fedora desktop distribution. Buildroot does not support anything like that. There is no concept of binary packages at all. Uh, Buildroot generates a fixed functionality root file system. So it spits out, uh, let's say, a SquashFS image or ext4 image or whatever file system format you like. And there's no package management system built in. And that's kind of a feature. It's, it's the way uh, we, we think it, it, it should be. Um, we don't think binary packages are really needed in, in most embedded Linux systems. So that's not something that's supported. And that's part of what makes Buildroot somewhat simpler. Um, the configuration. So how you tell those tools what to build and how to choose what to build uh, is done in very different ways. In Open Embedded Yocto, you do that by filling a number of uh, individual configuration files uh, with some specialized syntax, which is extremely powerful. It allows you to describe in a very fine-grained way what you want to build. Uh, but the known side, it's, it's quite, quite complex uh, to get into, into that and to understand what is going to be built and to customize that configuration exactly to your needs. Buildroot, as I said, uses kconfig. So all the configuration takes place from the uh, usual many config, x config interface that uh, many Linux developers are familiar with. So you feel really at ease with that. It's, it's really easy to get started. But the downside is that it's sometimes a bit limited in, in what you can express in the, in the configuration. Then the build strategy. Uh, is also um, um, somewhat different in, in Open Embedded. There is a very complex, and I'm, I, was, I wanted to say heavy, if you look at the disk space that the Yocto Open Embedded build takes, it's uh, fairly, fairly heavy. But it has, it, thanks to that complexity, it delivers really interesting features. It is able to cache build artifacts so that if you build something once, you don't have to rebuild it again. If you do a similar build for a slightly different platform, but as uses, let's say, the same CPU core, for example. Um, it also have um, lots of mechanisms to rebuild only what's needed when you make a change in the description of your, of your system. Um, at the opposite of the spectrum, Buildroot takes a much more simple but also dumb approach. Um, so there's really just a make file that builds things from A to Z. And there's no mechanism to cache build artifacts. So if you redo a build, you do the full build from scratch again. If you build a different system, but that is fairly similar, it's going to redo the full build anyway, because that's completely dumb. Um, so full rebuilds are uh, very often needed for some config changes. When you get experience, uh, you usually need to do uh, that less and less. But still, when you get started, it's, it can be a bit, a bit annoying. And it may be annoying for some big projects. Um, the ecosystem is also organized a little bit differently. Um, in the Open Embedded project, they have this concept of layers, which are a collection of recipes to build um, packages and images. And they have a common base uh, in the Open Embedded project itself. But then there are many third-party layers provided by uh, silicon vendors, provided by um, um, some vendors, by other communities that package, I don't know, Python or uh, virtualization technologies and other things like that. Uh, which is great. It means, it means lots of different communities can, can provide extra recipes, extra layers. Uh, the downside being that the quality and the maintenance is, is varying depending on who is providing the layer. Some layers are really well maintained and they are of really high quality. And some others are not so great. They do weird integration things, uh, which can cause problems. Uh, in Buildroot, we take a little bit more an approach that's similar to the Linux kernel. 
in that we encourage people to bring everything into the main tree. So all the support for all the platforms, for all the packages, they go into the same tree, which means there's, yes, a bit of friction to get in, but there's more review going on, there's more consistency, there's more um, um, uniform maintenance over what goes into the tree. Uh, so two different approaches. I don't think one, one is good or bad. It's just like different trade-offs that, that are being made. Um, complexity learning curve is also another uh, a big difference. Um, my open Embedded has a somewhat steep learning curve. Um, um, the tool that controls the, the orchestrate, the build, BitBake, remains a magic black box for a number of people. It's, it's kind of harder to, to get into what really is happening. Um, Buildroot has a much smoother and, and shorter learning curve. The tool is simpler to approach and reasonably simple to understand, but has its own limits, as I've shown earlier. So it's kind of a different trade-off, and some tools will, uh, some, sometimes for some projects, Buildroot will be more appropriate, and sometimes Yocto will be more appropriate. And there's also a very important aspect, um, the uh, personal taste or preference. Some people will feel better with one or the other tool, and not really because of any objective uh, criteria, but just because you feel like, yeah, that works better for you. And that's, that's also an important thing. So with that said, um, I wanted to talk more about what has been going on over the past two years in the, uh, the Builder community. So first I drew some, some graphs on the activity of the community. So here it's not over the past two years, but over the past 10, 12 years. And what we can see fairly easily is that the community is um, acting in a very like stable and mature way. There is not much change in the number of commits per release. So we are of about yeah, 1,500 commits per release uh, on, on average. And it's been like that for, for many years. So it seems like we've reached a, like our cruising altitude, I should say. And we can see pretty much the same with the number of contributors in every single release. We have about 100, 120, sometimes a little bit more individual contributors. And that has been stable for many years. Uh, which is kind of matching what we've seen with the number of commits per release. So let's say what looks like a mature um, community that is um, maintaining a, a, uh, an open source project. Um, traffic on the mailing list says it's pretty much the same thing, right? Since 2014 or so, we've been at pretty much stable in the number of emails on the mailing list. There is pretty heavy traffic. Uh, we use a, um, a contribution model uh, similar to the Linux scale. So all the patches are posted over email to the mailing list. They get reviewed there. Um, some people will call that old style. Um, some people will call that good style um, contribution model. Um, depending on the perspective. But that's the one we use, which also explains the traffic on the mailing list because lots of discussion takes place over email. But yeah, pretty uh, stable um, um, well, traffic on the mailing list, uh, which reflects the activity of the project. And the other and last graph that I have is the number of packages, uh, which is, I don't know if it's an important metric, but it is a metric, um, especially because we pull in the tree uh, all, the, all the packages rather than encouraging really people to keep, keep them um, on, their, on their side. Uh, so it's growing progressively. You can see it's almost a, a, a straight line that shows, yeah, it's progressing. Um, and more and more people are, are contributing uh, more and more packages. Um, there's not an explosion in the number of packages, just a, a normal growth um, based on, on what people use in their uh, peer root based projects. Um, one thing that we've um, uh, started uh, doing a little bit over two years ago, but not, not much more, is having a slightly longer um, uh, maintenance period for some releases. Uh, so we have releases every three months in the project um, in February, May, August, and November of every year, and it's been like that since, yeah. 12 years or so. So this is a very uh, uh, well-followed uh, development model that we've had. But in about three years ago, we decided to uh, pick one release every year, um, the February release, to be maintained for uh, a little bit over 12 months. Actually, it's more 13, 14 months just to have some overlap. So that's what the graph shows here. You can see that the 2022-02 release, which has been made in February this year, is going to be maintained until March, April of next year, um, so that there's a bit of overlap with the next um, uh, long-term uh, maintenance uh, release. Of course, some people can consider 12 months as not being long-term, and I would tend to agree, but that's a starting point, and we hope to kind of extend that later, but for now, that, that's where we are. Uh, so this has been ongoing uh, already for 2019-02, uh, 2020-02, 2021-02, and so we recently started the cycle for 2022-02. So that process works uh, fairly well now. 
Um, the way it works is that we have one of the maintainer of the project reviewing all the commits that go into the master branch and decides whether that commit, commit is something that's applicable to the LTS branch. So whether it's applicable is mainly related to whether it's a security fix or whether it's a bug fix. So that's really the two, the two main criteria. Um, and if that's the case, then that commit's gonna be backported. So there's fairly significant effort going on to like, review all those commits and decide which ones can or should go into the LTS branch. So I just picked some numbers here uh, from uh, 2022-02 and 2021-02, um, a number of commits that we have backported. I was actually surprised to see that it was less in 2021-02. I don't have really much of an explanation there. Uh, maybe I don't know, less security fixes, um, but other than that, I don't really see much, much um, other reason. Um, we make also point releases throughout the life of those LTS, and usually that's one per month. But even in between those releases, uh, the branch is publicly available. So if you want to pick security fixes earlier than having the next point release, those branches are yeah, pushed um, pretty much every day with the, the latest fixes that have been backported. Um, so right now, uh, as I say, 2022-02 is our current LTS branch. The previous one has been end of life on April 6th, so we gave like a uh, two months uh, window for, for people to uh, move on in addition to the fact that the schedule being known, uh, a number of our users are now planning for those migrations ahead of time. Um, the other thing that we've added uh, over the past two years is also related to security, is helping um, uh, match the set of packages that you have in your system with the list of known security vulnerabilities as listed by the NIST database. So there are two databases published by NIST, or probably more, but the two ones that we're using are the well-known CV database, which lists the uh, known security vulnerabilities. And there's also another one that's somewhat less known called CPE for Common Platform Enumeration, which is a database of identifiers for software releases. So by itself, it's not uh, security related, but those identifiers are used in the CVE database to identify which software is impacted by uh, a given security problem. So we have um, added this make package stat target, uh, which takes your, um, the set of packages in your current configuration and their version and matches that with those databases and produces an HTML and JSON output that tells you which of your package is, has no known security issues and which of your package has known security issues. Um, so as I say, yeah, it checks if packages are affected by known CVEs and also if their CPI identifier, and I'm gonna get a bit more into that, um, is known into the CPE database. Because if it's not known, then maybe we may be missing the, CV, um, uh, the CVs for your package because it's identified with a slightly different name in build root than in the NIST database. Um, so this works thanks to extra metadata provided by the build root packages. So in build root, every package has a make file that describes where the source code can be fetched and how to configure it, how to build it, etc. with lots of different variables. And we extended that with more variables. Um, they are, let's say, two main, it's a bit more than two, but there's uh, the two bullet points here. The first one is ignore CVEs. Um, that allows to tell build root to ignore a particular CV for one package. So you might be wondering, like, why would you do that? Uh, it's mainly when we backport locally into Beardroot a security fix for a problem. Let's say version 121 of a software package is affected by a security issue. Then make package that will tell you, oh, this is affected by CV I don't know, 2021, 1234. We backport the security fix. So the version is still a 121, but we have locally the, the security fix. So we want to tell that tool, okay, this CV you can ignore because we know we have fixed that issue. So we can write in the package ignore CV, CV 2021, 1234, and make page, package that will stop reporting that CV. Of course, next time we update the package to, uh, let's say, version 122, hopefully the, the, the security fix is in, we can drop the patch, we can drop that line, and we're happy. Um, the other variable set is uh, the package CP ID, and there's a number of them for, I think, vendor, product, version, and so on. Um, that allows to override the default CP identifier. Because as I said, the CV database is using CP identifiers to identify which software package is affected by a security problem. And those CP identifiers, they look like this, the CPE 2.3, A, and then the, the name of the kind of organization that's 
provides this software package, then the name of the software package itself, then its version, and there's a whole bunch of other metadata. So by default, Bidroot is going to uh, come up with a def uh, kind of a default value for that, but it may be wrong, right? Uh, so the default value is that one. So for the OpenSSL package, it would be CP23A OpenSSL underscore projects colon OpenSSL and then its version, which probably is not the one that's used in the NIST uh, CP database. Uh, so we have extra variables in the OpenSSL make file that says, oh, for that package, the vendor value and the product value may be this and that. All right, so that allows to us to match better with the uh, CP database. And that allows us to provide an output like that. So obviously, it may be uh, much bigger. Here, I just pick uh, four packages um, to illustrate uh, different situations that, that can occur. Uh, so we have uh, ATTR, ACL, ATOP, and BuzzyBox, um, which identify like the, the four main uh, situations that can take place. So here, it's mainly the, the last two columns that can be relevant. The rest is also interesting, but for, for other reasons. And, and the last two columns is really what uh, matters from a security point of view. So here we have a first example of this ATTR package. Um, so the, um, this package has at least some of the CPID variable defined. So it means that one Bitroot developer has already done the effort of adding this metadata in the package. So this developer has verified that Yes, in the CP um, uh, terminology, that package is referred with those particular values. And the uh, CP identifier actually matches. There is a match in the CP database. So we're kind of uh, confident that when we tell you uh, there are no CVs, uh, we're relatively confident it's the case because we know this identifier is really the one used in the CP database. The second example here on ACL, um, does not have any CPID variable defined. So we try to do a match in the CV database based on a defaultly, default created uh, CP identifier, but we cannot be really sure it's the correct one. And if it's not the correct one, we may be, may be entirely missing the CV information. So if you see something like that, you should be a bit cautious and say, oh, this is a bit strange. Maybe I should um, dig into uh, the CP database, find what is the right value for the ACL package, um, and if it turns out to be different than the default value Bitroot comes, comes up with, you need to fix that up to make sure you detect the CVs. So we've, gone, we've done a lot of work to add this CP metadata to a number of packages, but it's not done yet. Here we have a different situation. Uh, you can see in the, in the uh, uh, column before the last uh, that there's a matching CV, so CV uh, 2011-36-18 here. Um, so we found uh, a CP matching our, our version, and, but the CP apparently is not known. Um, we have some um, CP ID variable defined in Bildroot, but it's not known in the CP database. So you might wonder, like, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, if a, a Bildroot developer has gone through uh, the effort of adding CP uh, identifiers, why isn't that matching? It's because the CP database contains one entry per release of the software. So whenever the new version that is published, the CP database needs to be updated. And the NIST does that on a regular basis. But they are not doing that necessarily for all open source packages on an extremely regular basis. So that may be what's happening there. Probably in the CP database, there are other entries for ATOP, but not one matching the 2.6.0 version. All right? Um, so here, what we could and should do is contribute, and we've already done that a, a number of times, to the uh, CP database, and the NIST is welcoming contributions, and they update their database based, based on that feedback. Um, so here we have um, a similar situation uh, for the CP identifier, um, but in that particular case, there was no CV uh, identified in the CV database. So that's the sort of thing that we can now produce out, out of your Bidroot configuration, and the uh, NIST um, database and the make package stat automatically downloads the NIST database. So if you run that in a cron every day, uh, then every day you're going to get the latest uh, NIST uh, database and that will be matched again your package stat and you will know if you need to address some new CVs. Um, Security-wise, we also changed some default settings. There were a number of features that we already supported. Um, but that are now enabled by default. So all new Bitroot configuration will get those things enabled uh, right out of the box. 
And those are the, the I would say, some of the basic uh, security mechanisms available at the toolchain level that helps harden a bit uh, the user space code that you have. So things such as uh, position independent code, which is needed for some of the other security features in, in that slide, uh, stack smashing protection, uh, the F stack protector feature of, of GCC, Railroad, which makes uh, more parts of ELF um, uh, read only uh, to prevent like uh, oh, being overwritten by, by uh, um, well, exploits. Or Fortify source, which is implemented in, in the C library and adds more checks for buffer over overflows and that kind of thing. So all of that is now enabled by default, which means more people hopefully are going to make use of those sane security features. Um, also security uh, related, um, there's been quite a bit of work related to SLNX integration because some of our users deploy uh, build based systems in critical environments where uh, SLNX is mandatory. Uh, so here are some of the improvements we've made. First, we've made it possible to uh, set the SLNX uh, file security context at build time and not run time. Until then, it was necessary to do a first boot to set the context of, the, uh, of the, all the files in the file system at, at boot time, which obviously prevents read-only root file system and is anyway not really good. So now we do that at build time as part of the build process. So it's much, much better. Uh, we've also done a lot of work on the SLNX policy, which is um, the kind of the database that defines um, which object in, in, in the, uh, which entity in the system is allowed to do what on, it, on what objects in the system, so basically define the, the security policies. And the default um, uh, policy provided by the um, SLNX project is quite huge. So we've made it possible to um, keep only the base um, SLNX policy modules by default and then extend that. So it, it's stripped down uh, by a factor of 10 the, the size of the uh, ref policy which not only saves space, but also kind of makes it more, a little bit more manageable. Let's put it that way. Um, then we've um, allowed the ref policy package, which is in build root the package that downloads the SLNX reference policy and, and builds it. It's not code, but kind of builds it into the binary format that's expected by the um, uh, SLNX tools. And we've made it possible to enable additional modules, because if the, the default policy is no much more minimal, Depending on which uh, software packages you integrate, you will have to enable more modules to allow those extra packages to do their work without facing um, uh, SLNX denials. And we've made it possible uh, for that package to provide additional custom modules. So they are not in the reference policy, but they are modules that you have written for your own system. They can be integrated and be built as part of that um, ref policy. And then we've also allowed individual packages to um, provide their own additional SLNX modules. So a package like, um, I don't know, Nginx or Lite like or Systemd or uh, other things like that, or other system services that have their own SLNX policies, they can either enable uh, modules that are part of the standard ref policy, we're using the SLNX modules variable in their package, uh, so that's going to extend the ref policy with some of those standard modules. And they can also provide their own custom SLNX modules in an SLNX subdirectory of their package. So that's a lot of ways to customize the, um, the uh, ref policy. So we've gone from something that was completely monolithic, we were building the ref policy as is with all modules enabled, to something that's much more modular and, and uh, that adjusts depending on the packages that you enable in your configuration. So we've annotated uh, many uh, packages with this SLNX modules variable. So here is an example in, in systemd. Uh, so that's a line that comes from uh, package systemd, systemd.mk. Uh, and you see that we enable the modules uh, systemd, udev, and xdg from the ref policy. And the other thing that we've done, which is not in root itself, but we've also made contributions to the upstream uh, SLNX ref policy. Uh, to make it work with, with Bitroot. It was making assumptions that were not true in, in the general yeah, the next system, such as the one uh, Bitroot would build. Uh, so we made, we made extra contributions there, uh, which have gone upstream. All right, so that was about SLNX. Another uh, big area of work has been around uh, Go and Rust support, which um, I'm not going to tell you that they are uh, becoming more and more uh, 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 widespread in, in embedded uh, Linux systems. And those languages, they're, they're not the only one, but those two specifically have uh, language-specific package managers, which usually the, the community behind those languages love, and people doing build system hate. 
um, because they do have um, some, some challenges for, for build systems. So those package managers, uh, they do a lot of different things, but one of the things that they do, and which is the, 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 the part where they kind of conflict a little bit with what the build system is doing, is that they automatically download the dependencies. So in the Go world, you have Go modules, uh, which can download uh, tons of other modules that you depend on. In the Rust world, we have those crates that, you, that are described in cargo.toml that describes what extra kind of libraries or modules you need to build your, uh, your Rust application. So this is all great, but this breaks some fundamental features of build systems. Um, the build systems, and, and that's not specific to, to build root, I'm, I'm pretty sure Open Embedded is, is, has faced the same, the same uh, challenges and, and OpenWRT as well and others. Um, they all have some sort of download infrastructure that allows to cache locally uh, the download nodes to avoid re-downloading things. Um, they also have reproducibility concerns where we want to be sure that if you do a build today and a build in a year, you'll get the same results. So you don't want dependencies to be like dependent on the day you build, you get a slightly different version of a dependency, for example. But also they do, um, uh, build systems do legal uh, license information collection. So they collect the, the license information from the software that you integrate in your uh, embedded Linux system so that you can comply with the open source licenses in a proper way. And that is made a bit difficult if some random uh, Go or Cargo package downloads random set of dependencies out of nowhere uh, for which we don't really control the, the licenses. And so they, they represent some unique challenge. So in Buildwood, we have some, let's say, initial way. I don't know if it's perfect yet, but it's, it has at least allowed us to, to move forward. So we've extended our download infrastructure to be able to uh, inject some sp specific actions um, depending on the type of package. Until now, the download logic was only based on where we are downloading from. So we're downloading, downloading a tarball over HTTP, or we're creating from a Git repository, or uh, we're, I don't know, checking out some subversion thing or whatever. But it was not dependent on what we were getting. So now we have what we call post-download helpers that allows us to inject a little bit more um, logic within the download step. So um, we have now two of those helpers, one for Go and one for Cargo. Um, and they are run with, again within the download step so that we can download the uh, actual source code of the package, tell the package manager either Go or Cargo to download the dependencies, and bundle all of that into the tarball that, that will then contain not just the source code of the, the software package, but also the source code of all its dependencies and all the license files. So that means that locally we have a cache with everything that we need to do the build. We can have a hash that um, uh, makes sure that this tarball is always the same. If there's a change, we have a rep reproducibility problem. It also ensures that we have all the license files of all the dependencies. All right, so that's what we've, we've done here. In, yeah, hopefully that's still working. Uh, so in the past, we're just downloading a tarball, putting it aside, or cloning a Git repo, creating a tarball out of it, putting it aside. No, we have an intermediate step in between where we can invoke the package manager um, system to download the, the dependencies. Um, so it, it looks like this. Um, actually, in, in packages, it's, it's almost invisible, right? Here is a, a package called TinyFire, which is implemented in Go. Um, so it uses in Buildroot what we call the Golang package infrastructure. And it, we just describe, okay, where I, I want to download it from. So here it's from GitHub, what is its license, and the Go mod, uh, where it is located inside the, the, the source tree. And so it's totally invisible, but what's going to happen inside that is we clone that Git repository. Then we're going to run Go mod something, whatever magic um, uh, Go needs to download its dependencies. And all those dependencies will be in the tarball that get extracted into the build directory before doing the build. Um, similar thing for Rust. Um, here the uh, build root package infrastructure is called cargo package, but exactly the same will happen. We're going to clone that GitHub repository called cargo to retrieve the dependencies and then create the tarball out of that, verify that this tarball has the hash that we expect it to have so that you and me, when we do the builds, we know we, we are building at least from the same source code. Um, and then we can, we can start off the build. All right, um, switching completely uh, to a different topic, uh, Python. Um, so you might wonder, Python also has some package manager like pip, for example. 
But in Bitroot for Python, we've decided to create individual packages for every Python module. So we have many pack Bitroot packages that package Python modules. So we have a kind of a different strategy uh, between uh, uh, Go, uh, Rust on one side, where we rely on their package uh, manager, and Python on the other side, where we create individual packages for the different Python modules. So on Python, what we did, um, one thing that was important is we finally removed Python 2.x. I think lots of Linux distributions had to go through through that process. So uh, same same here. Um, so it was finally removed in 2020-02. We probably kept it a little bit longer than other Linux distributions because we know embedded people may be a bit slower at moving things to like new technologies and, and especially in that case, the new version of Python. And, uh, but we really wanted to get that done before 2020-02 because that's our new LTS onto which we do a lot of backports. So that was really great to get rid of that uh, before we enter that maintenance period. And also that allowed to remove a lot of complexity that we had um, internally. It was not necessarily super visible to users, but internally it was a bit messy uh, to handle the Python 2, Python 3. Sometimes you have Python 3 on your target, but you need Python 2 on your host to build all the things. Sometimes it's the opposite. There's a lot of cases to handle. So no, it's basically all Python 3 everywhere, uh, which really simplifies things a lot um, in, in, yeah, in terms of complexity. The other thing that's been added more recently is support for, uh, I don't know how you call that, PEP, PEP 517 build system support, really a crappy name, but that's how they call it. Um, so if you've done Python, I'm, I'm sure you know setup.py, uh, build install, which was kind of the traditional way, uh, which used either distotils or setup tools. So it's been a, a standardization around a new way of um, describing how to build um, a Python external module using a pyproject.toml file. So instead of being a Python script, it's no more metadata oriented. And uh, in Buildwood, we've added uh, support for uh, Python modules that use fleet-based uh, build systems. So PEP, uh, if I understood correctly, 517 uh, kind of uh, mandates this pyproject.toml, but multiple build systems can be used, one of them being fleet, and which we support. So this setup type variable, I don't know if my laser is working, yep. Here, this setup type variable, uh, we already had support for distutils and setup tools uh, so that Bitroot knew what to build before your module so that it could successfully install. Um, but now we also have support for fleets, which ends up uh, bringing the dependencies that are needed before we build your particular module using the, the appropriate invocation. So that's now been supported. There, we don't have that many packages yet using that, but apparently there is a fairly uh, strong trend in the, in the Python community to move over that, so we expect uh, to see a broader adoption of this in more and more packages in the future. Um, obviously, one of the things that we've done, you've seen this, this curve, right, this kind of flat line of, of new package addition over time. So we've added more packages over the past two years. There's no, uh, yeah, no mystery about that. Uh, so we've added about 290 new packages over, over two years. Uh, so I tried to make some uh, an extract of significant ones, but of course, uh, what is significant is very subjective, uh, and I had to skim over a lot of new libraries that looked interesting, but were yeah, maybe not that relevant. So here I took an extract, so you can see. We have uh, tracing utilities, that's pretty uh, pretty strong. LibUring for doing IOUring uh, things with the kernel. Uh, Zabbix for monitoring, WirePlumber to do audio together with, um, 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 what's the name? Um, I'm gonna um, forget it. Um, OpenCV and new Qt5 modules, obviously a lot of Python packages as well. So that's um, it for packages. We've done CI improvements as well. So we've already, uh, we're doing a lot of uh, CI around build testing and runtime testing. We've extended our uh, uh, build time testing to test more random configurations. They were already somewhat random, but only partially randomized. Now we test fully random configuration all the time, 24 seven, to detect incorrect dependencies. On the arch architecture support, we support many, many CPU architectures, probably more than any other build system, at least that I know of. We've added support for S390. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Not really embedded, but people at IBM contributed that. They use Bitroot for some of their work. 
and we've added support for RISC-V 64-bit no MMU. So we already had RISC-V support, but no MMU support came in. And we recently dropped NDS32 because that got dropped from the Linux kernel, so we kind of followed that as well. And my last slide, because I see I'm progressively running out of time, is on toolchain support. So for the cross-compiler, in Bitwood we support two mechanisms. Either we build it from source, or we use a pre-compiled compiler that you have from I don't know, your hardware vendor. Um, and here, the main improvements were on the internal side, so when we build the toolchain ourselves, is basically keeping up to date with the latest version of GCC, Binitils, glibc, uh, uslibc, muscle, and all those things. On the external toolchain side, what we mainly did was uh, do integration for the uh, toolchains that we provide at Bootlin. So we have a separate website unrelated to BuildRoot called toolchains.bootlin.com. It has almost 200 pre-compiled toolchains for many different CPU architectures. And now there is pre-built support for that in the BuildRoot tree. So if you go and look at the screenshots at the bottom, uh, you can directly from BuildRoot choose, OK, I want this ARM64 toolchain, uh, bleeding edge or stable in different versions, different C libraries, and that's readily available in the tree. All right, time is up. So um, that's my last slide. I'm teaching a course on BuildRoot uh, in September. Um, our materials are freely available. We are a fully open source company, so all our training slides are yeah, free on our, our site. There is even a GitHub repo with our source code for our materials. But if you're interested in learning more, I will be teaching this course. So if you like this talk and you're interested in Bitroot, that's maybe a good, a good opportunity. And with that said, because time is up, I'm going to open up for questions now. Questions? Yeah, please. If you can maybe find a mic. Somewhere, oh, or I, I might have it. Oh, okay, you're handling it. Uh, I'm curious why you made the design decision to do Python packages differently than the Rust and Go packages. Um, yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. It's um, somewhat tied to how people expect things to be built in the Python world. Um, the, the build process of one module expects the other, the, the modules that it depends on to already be installed, right? It doesn't take care itself of, don't, of downloading the other things. While in the Go and, and Rust world, it's more really part of the build process that it, it's gonna grab the, the dependencies. And also there in the Rust and Go world, they're, they're more often tied to one particular version of their dependencies. Uh, which means that one package may, may need a dependency in version A, and another package may need that same dependency in version B, which would be a challenge. It, it's not perfect, right, but it's kind of the, the line we've been so far able to, to draw between the two, the two camps. Yep, go ahead. Um, SBOM support, question mark? Um, yeah, so the, we already have um, a tool for collecting um, the license information of all the packages because we have that metadata. Uh, we collect all the license files, we have hashes for them. So we, I think we have, I believe, pretty much what's, what would be needed for proper SBOM, but we don't yet generate something that complies with the SBOM format itself. But that would definitely be something to, to look at. Yep, um, so I think that's it. Um, yeah, we're running over time. So I can take questions in the old way. Thank you very much for, for attending and um, yeah, enjoy the, the rest of the conference.